I had a grandfather who uh, was from Switzerland and came over in 1892 and was a painter, landscape painter. And he actually set up a fine art studio in St. Louis and uh, later moved to Decatur, Illinois. Uh, and we would go visit him when I was a kid. To put his three kids through college, he ended up being more of a house painter and apparently had a pretty good clientele in the Chicago area from what I can put together from what I've learned. But uh, having his paintings, I think, on the walls in our house made painting a, an okay kind of natural thing to do. So that was the first step. And then as a kid, I got interested in uh, around 10 years old, 12 years old, the growing interest in space travel, rockets, etc., reading science fiction, and got aware of... Uh, the famous book, Conquest of Space. This is my old copy of it. And uh, this had paintings by a guy named Chesley Bonestell, who became a friend later on. But the, one of the really famous paintings was this beautiful rocket ship on the moon. And it's pretty amazing how many of the Apollo engineers who put the actual Apollo astronauts on the moon had that book when they were kids. So uh, this idea of uh, making paintings of other planets just uh, really kind of blew me away and I was really interested in trying to do that. The, the connection between the art and the science is interesting and I'm, I'm not sure I understand it myself or quite where it is in my own in my own head. My real background has been in, in planetary science and doing work on the origin of the moon, for instance. Uh, my buddy Don Davis and I, not the artist Don Davis, who's known in space art circles, but a planetary scientist named Don Davis. He and I wrote the first paper on what is the current model about the origin of the moon that a large object hit the Earth as the Earth was aggregating uh, and forming and blew off rocky material from the surface of the Earth. And that's the material the moon came from. Well, there's an example of something. There's all kinds of dramatic possibilities for paintings there, and I've done paintings of various stages of that event. When we first suggested it in 74, 75, there were no computer models yet. Once that idea became well known, then, then lots of people were making numerical computer models of what would happen if you have a massive rocky material, another massive rocky material. You try to simulate that in a computer. So I would take the, the computer printouts or the figures that were published in those papers. Uh, particularly in the early days, they were pretty uh, sterile, you know, like a bunch of black dots represents the object coming in and then the black dots fly in different directions. But, you know, I try to reconstruct, okay, what, what would that actually look like to a human being? And that's been my focus in doing astronomical paintings pretty much ever since is what what would that place look like to a human being if you could be there and that's kind of important to think about when you're making this kind of painting because I mean, there's all sorts of situations in in astronomy for instance there will be an infrared star that's putting out a lot of infrared light and we can now photograph in infrared light. So there's that issue about what, what colors do you really try to represent. And you can imagine intelligent or non-intelligent life forms on other planets, let's say with an infrared star, 
and their optical system would almost certainly evolve to make use of that infrared light. And there's a kind of an interesting thing when you look at the solar spectrum, light coming out from the sun is, tends to be in the middle of sort of yellowish colors. That's the same sensitivity that our eyes have. Our eyes, our eyes are sort of calibrated to, to be sensitive to those same colors that the sun is actually putting out. So you could certainly imagine aliens who are you know, more adapted to other colors. But I try to, as I say, I try to think about what, what would the human experience be if you could go to that planet or that extrasolar planetary system around some other star and, and see that and experience it. If I go to a meeting and I hear about a new discovery, that'll be one thing that, that tends to, you know, bing, you know, <laughs> suddenly an idea for a painting comes into my head. And I'd say a lot of, a lot of the pictures I do are that way. Uh, is it you maybe happier? You want to put this on the easel maybe? So we talked about this book, The Conquest of Space, that I had as a boy and, and how inspiring it was to me. And as I said, a lot of the engineers that actually put the, the rocket on the moon had, that, had this very book as kids and they were inspired in the same way I was. And I got to know Bonestell, so I did a painting that was my homage to Bonestell, which was to copy his rocket and put it on the moon that we actually know about today. Because at the time that Bonestell was doing these paintings, people thought the moon was very, very craggy. There's so much impact, meteorite impact going on that it sand blasts all the features on the surface, so the mountains are actually quite rounded by all these, uh, you know, impacts the size, something like this size, that you're throwing out material and grinding up the rocks and so on. But it was fun to put Bonestell's rocket with its little red stripes you know, on, on the moon as we know it today. Life began in, in hot places like those vents on the floor of the ocean. Um, the older idea was that they were, life began in nice little tidal pools. I did the original of that logo for our group. <laughs> PSI are supposed to be takeoffs on Saguaro Kaka. Yeah. And then the PSI is, is also the Greek letter Psi which has the shape of Saturn in its rings. It's 
So this pretty much this whole wall is the result of uh, it's the result of taking my paints with me on various science meetings in various cities. Mostly 11 by 14 paintings that can easily fit in a in my uh, canvas bag that is usually gets me to Europe and back. The big castle in a little island off of uh, Castle and and Cathedral, Saint Michel, on, off, just off the coast of France, on the coast of France. The idea of planetary paintings, to me, you know, are are a record of what humanity thought that planet was going to look like in that decade. And I, I always tell museum curators, you know, for heaven's sakes, don't throw out the old space paintings because they aren't accurate anymore. Because, you know, like Bonestell's paintings give the best sense of what people thought Mars was going to be like. And before the first landing, which was the American Viking lander in, 17, in uh, 1976, that we all thought that it was going to be a deep blue sky because the, the air pressure on Mars was known to be something like what it is at 100,000 feet or so. So that was the plan. And I have, when the Viking landed, it took the first pictures right away. That was the first realization that, hey, it isn't a blue sky. It's this kind of apricot pinkish sky. But that makes that kind of an interesting painting because that was uh, 1970. Three, I guess that says. And I got the idea of a dust devil, right? I mean, there are dust devils on Mars, but we now know the sky isn't that blue. I try to paint fast when I'm painting. That was partly the in influence of uh, well, one of the guys in our IAAA group, Kara Zothmary, who was a big kind of fan of Van Gogh and who, you know, who apparently often painted pretty fast and you would put the paint on with straight out of the tube and so on. So uh, he circulated the idea of, you know, paint outs where we'd go on our workshops and like, okay, we're just going to sit here for one hour and then see what you get. And it teaches you to stop, well, stop overthinking, but stop agonizing about every little brush stroke and trust, trust what you know about the medium that you're painting with. And so I try to do that and I kind of, it's, it's fascinating psychologically. I'll, I really have this experience of losing myself in the painting. And many of those take maybe three hours, these outdoor plain air paintings. And I'll be sitting in my little chair and I have a tripod. Well, the Russians gave us little tripods that have a wooden box on top with all the paints and a place for the painting and I use that a lot. Yeah, so this is a, a painting that I did in Arches National Park, and uh, uh, people might, who have been there might recognize this arch, uh, but I wanted to make a Mars painting, so what I do is uh, leave out the, the bushes, uh, change the sky color a little bit to this kind of strange pinkish, off pink <laughs> Mars sky color. I added an impact crater, and there's some astronauts wandering around on the surface. So that's, that's one of the most recent paintings I've done. It's a great example of you know, you're doing a painting like this and it leads you to start thinking about things that aren't particularly talked about in the scientific literature. This is, this is a painting that has been in progress for quite a long time. We, we know a certain amount about the origin of the solar system and that there was a massive disk of dust and gas around the solar system as the sun formed. The sun stars form by collapsing down until they get so hot that it starts nuclear reactions. And we've seen these kinds of disks around other stars. So uh, this is trying to imagine our own system. And what I've done here is just with chalk, uh, I was planning to put in some aggregated bodies because that's how the asteroids and the planets got started that these dust grains would neighboring dust grains would collide and stick together and 
the more the more you get the more you get a bunch of dust grains together, the next one embeds itself in in that dust and and stays in, and so they grow and they grow and grow. And uh, what ultimately happens, the the biggest one in this neighborhood gets big enough. It starts to pull in the gra its gravity starts to pull in the neighboring bodies. So there's a runaway effect that once you get uh, something that's maybe a thousand miles across, it's starting to really pull in other bodies and begins to dominate in that zone. And we think that that's why the planets are spaced out in each one in one zone in the solar system. I want to play around with this some more and paint in these kind of asteroid-like bodies, maybe work, work on the, cool. the effects of the clouds a little bit more. Um, so that's the kind of thing that's standing around in the studio. I was a big fan of science fiction in high school and college. Uh, we had a, our physics department had in, at Penn State had a science fiction book club and we'd meet and decide which were the best books and so forth. There was the Asimov Foundation series, a trilogy. There's a lot of physics in that because the concept was that psychologists had worked out theories that could predict what masses of people would do, like a culture, but they couldn't take into account if you had one specific person like Hitler or somebody who organized the culture. And so, and that whole idea was based on the kinetic theory of gases in this room, that there's all these molecules of gas moving around and it's hard to predict where any one molecule will go, but, you, but if you have the theory of the mass of molecules, you can predict the pressure and the temperature and the, you know, all the characteristics of, of the atmosphere or the air in the room. So that was, that was a big favorite among, among our physics group. Ray Bradbury books, I got to meet Ray Bradbury, know him a little bit. He wrote some nice blurbs for some books that I did. Uh, wonderful guy. And I, my, my feeling is that science fiction has changed from that era. There's more in, interest now in just kind of fantasy adventures. But um, the science fiction in the 50s and early 60s was... Uh, a lot more driven by ideas and, and ideas of future cultures and ideas of kind of like Jules Verne, you know, some machine, a rocket that will take you to the moon and things like that. I did write a number of college textbooks and that gave me also a little more freedom to talk about the history of the science. I think a really good way to teach science is not, this is the fact, you got to learn these facts, but why do we believe this fact? And that has a story behind it, you know, the history of where those ideas came from. And I've been amazed when I you know, realized that the Greeks around 500 BC had figured out just from geometry that the moon is closer to the earth than the sun is, that the, the, moon, the sun is probably much larger than the moon. They had ideas about the earth being spherical. There was actually a measurement of the diameter of the Earth that was apparently within 10 or 20 percent of the right number. And so much of that was forgotten in the Middle Ages. So those stories, you know, that's storytelling. And I like doing that in my textbooks. The textbooks were pretty successful. That then led to doing some popular science books. And then finally, it, it led to trying my hand at some novels. I've published a couple of novels one a science fiction novel about Mars and one a historical novel about uh, the period in the 1500s when the Spanish were exploring up through Mexico into what's now the United States through, through Arizona, not too far from here. So writing about that in a novel form was, was interesting for me. And, uh, you know, and I think there's an aging process going on here too that I had the experience that the things that interested me in science when I was 14 years old that I wanted to know about. What was it going to be like on Mars? What would it be like on the moon? All those first order facts, you know, just kind of the simple basic questions have pretty much been answered. 
And that's, that's the stuff that I grew up wondering about. And so now we know answers. So in a, in a sense, I feel like my interests have shifted a little bit more toward the sociology and the history and the, the where did the ideas come from and why were they believed and why were some of them wrong and, uh, and their interactions between people. Uh, so pe people are the biggest mystery of all, right? It's very hard to, to have any theory of uh, how a human being operates or what their personality is going to be like or you know, what, what decisions they make. Irrationality comes into much of our behavior. I just started a, a picture recently that I don't think I've seen anybody else do this effect and I'm puzzled why not, but I was realizing that on the moon, if uh, the, the sun is up, let's say, and it's behind a mountain, and now the sun's just coming out from behind the mountain, covering up the disk of the sun, and you're just beginning to see the, the little corona of the sun sticking, The you don't have any sky color, it's all black, you're seeing just empty space and the light from the sun. But there will be these, these bright red um, prominences that I'm gonna put into the painting, which are in fact masses of you know, incandescent hydrogen that is glows with a very red color. But otherwise the light, so there's no sunlight down here yet. Sun's behind the mountain. So this is illuminated by the blue earth. There's a little bit of earth glow there sun's kind of coming through from behind the mountain over there. Um, there's a crater here with some rocks scattered around that are blown out of the crater. That's similar to the situation where the sun's just coming out from behind a total eclipse. And there's actually a phenomenon, many people have never seen it, but it's called the zodiacal light. And there's a, a band of light, Bonestell used to put it in his paintings. Here's the zodiacal light that I was describing. And you can see that if you go out at night, as I say, you know, an hour or so after sunset. Of course, as the sun goes down, the zodiacal light goes with it. So, so you can only see it for an hour or two after sunset or an hour or two before sunrise. But it's this faint uh, band of light. You will see this band of light sticking up into the sky called the zodiacal light because it's along the zodiac, which is just the plane of the solar system. You're looking at the sun, planets are all moving around the sun in this particular plane, and there's dust all through that plane from comets and asteroids that are broken apart. So that dust is illuminated by the sun, you can actually see that. So I was thinking of this painting on the surface of the moon where you you get in a position where you can see the little red light, but also there's a diacal light and the earth is up here, a little crescent earth. I can show you the painting at some point. <laughs>